Okay, thanks everyone for coming to our session. Uh, BDT 402, high throughput computing, AWS, and the God particle finding new subatomic particles in the Amazon cloud. Uh, my name is Jamie Kinney. I lead uh, HPC and scientific computing for the public sector within Amazon Web Services. Uh, and I'm honored to have Maroon Livney with me co-presenting today. Maroon is the, the chair for computer sciences at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, his organization also leads the development of high throughput Condor or HD Condor. And uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison is also the, um, one of the institutions that participates in the CERN collaboration. And uh, finally, but also uh, very importantly, uh, Maroon is the principal investigator for the Open Science Grid. So for today's presentation, I'm just going to give a little bit of background uh, talking about um, uh, EC2, the instance types, and the evolution of those resources, especially as they relate to the, to the scientific and research community. Uh, talk a bit about the spot market, and then as quickly as possible, let Maroon talk about a, a really cool project that they've worked on uh, with us over the past year. Uh, so my role, as I mentioned, uh, focusing on, on scientific computing, I'm, I'm fortunate to get to work with high energy physics institutions, uh, space agencies around the world, universities, and uh, we're increasingly seeing a, a very broad range of, of workloads. And, and some of those are, are, are going to be the type of high throughput computing, which, which Maroon will describe. Uh, we also see a lot of high performance computing or, or tightly coupled applications. Uh, but increasingly, we're also seeing the need for collaborative research environments. And so I, I help a lot of organizations bring their open and, and public data sets onto the cloud so that other researchers can take advantage of, of their work and extend it and, and do even more interesting things and perhaps just use that as a reference for the work that they're doing or, or extend it beyond. Um, so the, the background that I wanted to cover first is looking at the, uh, the, the range of instance types that we offer. So this, this picture comes from awsnow.info. Um, and this is a, about a week old, so it doesn't include the newest of our, of our uh, graphic intensive instance types, the G2. Uh, but it does show that uh, we've evolved quite a bit over the, over the past six years that we've been offering EC2. Um, initially, when we developed the service, it was designed to support uh, websites. And so we have uh, machines that have a single core, a uh, little bit over a gigabyte of memory, didn't have persistent storage. And then as customers started wanting to do things like run memory intensive database workloads and eventually starting to run high throughput computing workloads and, and more tightly coupled applications, we added capabilities around um, 10 gigabit networking capabilities. We added support for SSDs, the, the very latest processors from Intel. Um, if, I don't know if you remember when we launched the CC2 8XL instance type, which one of my personal favorites, um, when this was, was launched, it was actually launched three months before Intel actually announced the Sandy Bridge processor. So for those of you who were working with us um, kind of under a private NDA before the instance type came online, you, you, you could actually uh, test out this processor that wasn't yet available on the market. And so over time, we've added more and more capabilities and, and hope to continue to evolve, um, especially the interconnect between these, these virtual machines. Now, in addition to making uh, available a broad range of, of compute resources, you know, faster I.O., more memory for uh, genomics assembly workloads, things of that nature, we also um, have been, continued to evolve the, the purchasing models or the, or the way that you would actually provision this infrastructure. So again, when you first uh, began working with EC2, or at least when the service first came online, uh, the only way to procure was through on-demand instances. You pay the same price per hour for every hour that you're running the virtual machine. Um, and then we added support for spot instances and reserved instances uh, and eventually dedicated instances, uh, especially for things like HIPAA compliant workloads uh, and, and a free tier. Now what we're going to be talking about today extensively is how to use spot resources. Uh, so quick show of hands, how many people are, are actually using spot instances today? Okay, uh, how many people have tested spot but aren't yet using it? Okay, I think Spot is one of the, especially for, uh, for high throughput computing workloads and for uh, asynchronous, ba asynchronous batch processing workloads, I think it's, uh, the, in, my, in my opinion, the, probably the only way that you should be using EC2 or, or certainly the, the primary way that you should consider uh, procuring EC2 um, in that it, it gives you uh, substantial discounts um, over, over what you could get from the on-demand market um, and assuming that your application can handle the way in which we, we make those resources available. So for those of you who aren't familiar with EC2 Spot, um, it's a great model for getting access to machines. Uh, for example, the CC2 8XLs that, that are my favorites, you know, they're normally $2.40 an hour on the on-demand market. But if you go to the Spot market, you can almost always get, get a hold of them for about 25.3 cents an hour. Now, uh, this shows a graph that you can, you can view from the AWS web console, and you can see that you know, over a three-month stretch in uh, one of our availability zones in the, uh, in the Oregon region, 
um, you have pretty flat pricing for this instance type. Now, the thing to take into consideration is that this price is based on supply and demand. And so if you're working in another availability zone, um, also in the Oregon region, where we might not have as many of these instance types, and a conference like Supercompute or reInvent uh, comes along, or you've got uh, cycle computing doing a, a, a very large scale 120,000 core job on, on AWS, uh, it could push the price, the, the market price for these instances up pretty high. And so uh, one of the keys uh, to effectively utilizing Spot is of course to, to design your, your bidding strategy and to ensure that you're using the right instance type for the task at hand. And so if you can take advantage of that, you'll get massive discounts on, on your compute um, and you'll be able to uh, potentially run jobs that you otherwise couldn't run in the cloud or on-premise or anywhere else. Of course, there is the caveat that if your, uh, if your bid price gets exceeded by changes in, in either supply or demand, uh, we'll turn off your machines and give them to somebody who's willing to pay a little bit more for them. So with that background in mind, I'd now like to uh, hand over the microphone to Marone, who will talk about an application uh, that we've seen at, at, uh, at CERN. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, it was a virtual transfer of the microphone. <laughs> I have my own virtual microphone. So uh, I will uh, spend, I think, a, a good chunk of my presentation uh, trying to convince you about uh, adopting the high throughput computing lifestyle and show you what are all the wonderful things that science can do with it. And then as we get towards the end, I will uh, connect it to, the, uh, to, to spot and to, to, to cloud computing. So uh, Jamie asked me to uh, do some, some physics at the beginning. So uh, I apologize in advance. It's uh, way above my pay grade, uh, although I started as a physicist, but it didn't last long. So the, the, the basic message of the first part is uh, that the director general uh, last year, sorry, uh, ah, this is, I cannot even manage this that the, uh, the Director General of CERN announced, uh, asked the crowd, uh, do we have a discovery uh, in uh, July 12? And the crowd uh, agreed. And the crowd represented over 6,000 scientists that are involved in two experiments, ATLAS and CMS. The reason why it's important, because I will get back to these names or acronyms that we are moving forward. And uh, an important part of the message was that a, a key contributor to, to this success was the grid computing. And maybe another message that I want to send to, the, to you is that grids are not dead, and I would argue that they're very related to, to cloud. So now we are getting into the, the, the slide that I list. Uh, feel comfortable with besides this, uh, this control. And that is uh, an introduction of the standard model. So the basic idea is the following, that uh, almost 50 years ago, theoretician predicted that there is this uh, a spin zero particle system uh, that is missing at the bottom that is called uh, the Higgs boson. And until then, they found all the other ones the six quarks and the six uh, uh, leptons and the four force carrier particles. And they said for the whole thing to work and for each of you to have a mass and not turn into a bunch of particles that are dispersing into the world, this little guy needs to be there. And it took these uh, 6,000 scientists, uh, probably now 20 years, to come up within Five Sigma with the conclusion that the particle is, the, is there. They saw the signs of it. Now, what, what took to, to get or to find this, this particle? So one of the experiments, just ATLAS, these are the numbers from, from ATLAS, they made millions of billions of collisions. They recorded and analyzed about 4.2 billion events. Out of them, they expected to have about a quarter of a million Higgs uh, that were produced in these events. Out of them, they detected 350 in one form and eight in the other form. 
So this big conclusion is based out of these 360 events that gave them the, six, the five sigma that uh, at the moment say that the standard model is uh, correct and you don't have to fear that you will disperse suddenly into particles that are moving in the speed of light into who knows where. So this is the kind of, of science that we are talking about and it has been from the, almost the very beginning, I started working with CERN uh, in, the in the early 90s, actually in 1990, they were high throughput computing. Basically an endless stream of independent jobs which are interrelated, usually through I.O. I will produce something and then you will consume it, but it's not this tightly coupled MPI stuff. And the, the need for this kind of computing is not unique only to high energy physics. And as we were working on, on these kind of problems in the mid 90s, I coined the term high throughput computing. And the way that I differentiated high throughput computing from high performance computing is I said that my users don't care about what you can do in a second. My users care what they can do in a year. And unfortunately, you cannot simply take what you can do in a second and multiply it by the number of seconds and get what you can do in a year. Because they were looking for a sustained 24-7, 365 kind of activity that has to be built in a very different way and also requires a lot of automation. And uh, that's a subject by itself, is how do you bring automation into the different groups that have to do science at this scale? And you don't turn all of them to be slaves feeding the, the machine. So that's where high throughput computing started. And actually, in 92, uh, I gave a presentation at CERN that was talking about something that uh, I believe uh, brings you all here is a worldwide computing environment. At the time, we talked about uh, flocks of condors that actually now we have to call them HD condors because once you are successful, somebody goes after your trademarks and forces you to change your name. So any one of you who is coming up with something that they hope will succeed, do your due diligence before you spend half a million dollars trying to prevent somebody from changing everything in your code. And we basically had at the time already a computing infrastructure that was able to run jobs submitted in Russia through Europe to Wisconsin. So the idea has been there all along, and a key element of it was really the, the concept of high throughput computing. So it, it, it was not a surprise with the open science grid, which is basically responsible for delivering the computing capabilities uh, from the US to the LHC effort, to the to this international activity. The US is contributing somewhere in the range of 30, 35% of the computing capacity that was involved in the discovery of the Higgs, came together and said, yes, we are, we are committed to the idea of distributed high throughput computing. We want to advance the technology and we want to promote the adoption. And here's what we on Open Science Grid do on a daily basis. So on the average, in the last year, we did uh, 2 million core hours. We move on the average one petabyte of data across 120 sites in the United States. And 60% of it goes to the LHC, to Atlas and CMS. And the rest is going to other physics experiments and to other users across the United States. So that's what we do day in, day out. And I will tell you later about some of the technologies that we are using because that will be, I think, relevant and applicable to, to the cloud discussion. So a key principle in what we do and how we do it is the idea of submit locally and run globally. We found over the year that it's critical to give our end user the experience of I'm running on my desktop. That's the way Condo started. I can submit all the job to my desktop, and it will just happen to run on many 
workstations around the department, around the building, and today somewhere in the cloud. But it can run globally, but the summit is, is locally because we always believe that the user doesn't only come with work, the user also comes with resources. Here's my 50,000 jobs, and here is my 200 core cluster that is sitting under my desk, and here is a check for $10,000 that you can use to buy resources on spot. Go, get the work done. So in Condor, from the very beginning, and I think this is another key principle that I want to leave with you today, we had a separation between the allocation of resources and the delegation of work. And we have been using matchmaking, and I will give you sort of a quick overview of how it works, in condo for both steps. And it's important to remember that whenever we are trying to get work done, we first of all have to hire somebody, and then we have to go to this individual and say, get this work done, and let me know if you failed, or let me know if you succeeded, and, and all this kind of stuff. So the way that we do it in, in Condor goes in the following way. We have the, the source that has work to do on the left, and we have a destination on the right. And the destination comes and says, I'm a destination, and I am willing to serve you. And I send it after the matchmaker. The source says, I'm a source, and I'm looking for somebody to do the work for me. The matchmaker looks at the two sides and says, OK, you guys are a match, and notifies them. And like a good matchmaker says, I'm done. Everything from this point on is your responsibility. We are not a broker. You know, eBay-like. We just help you to come together. After that, you're on your own. Then the source is claiming the resource and saying, you are mine. And by the way, everyone can change his or her mind in the middle of this for whatever reason. And we are not going into the moral aspect of whether this change of mind is, is OK. And then we get into the second matchmaking, where now the source says, I have a resource. Which of the work that is waiting should be selected and delegated to the other side? And that's what is happening, I would say, millions and millions of times every day on all the different condo systems that are either doing high energy physics or are rendering the movies for DreamWorks, the same kind of stuff. And there are obviously a lot of details, but that would be useful to, to keep in mind as we are moving forward. So the submit locally is saying, I have the work here, and then I'm looking for whatever resources the matchmaker can bring to me, and I will use them to, to delegate to them the work. In Condoland, and it will also be useful for my next slides, is we call the source, the SCED D, that's where the work is, and we call the execution daemon the start D. Now, over the years, we have extended the capability of the, of the SCED D to go beyond just talking to the start D. And we basically said, if I can delegate work, I can delegate work to somebody who does the work, or I can delegate to somebody who knows somebody who can do the work. So if there is a bad system there, I will delegate to it the work and hope that it will come back to me with the result. So in the early grid days, we have been using grid compute element as an interface. We could do it over SSH or what have you. But as a result of this, we have the flexibility to do all these kind of wonderful thing. So if you think about it, you have a user at the top, or a Dagman, which is our workflow uh, engine, which is supporting directed acyclic graphs, and it submits to the local SCADD. The local SCADD may have access to a local condo pool, and through this local condo pool, it can run local condo application. It can also interact directly with a remote condo pool and get Condo application going there. We call it flocking, or we can do what we call Condo C. And I will be around if anyone wants to get a better understanding of what all this means. But the SCAD D can also delegate work through the grid compute element into remote batch system. 
And then these, this work will sit in the queue of the remote VAT system. And when the VAT system decides to run the job, the job will run there. But then I will call it a grid application because the SCAD-D has to know whether it goes to this uh, LSF or PBS queue or it goes into the condo. So somebody has to start making decisions. Should it go left or should it go right? The other downside of it is that it does binding of the work way too early because you, know, you don't know whether this LSF queue will ever run your job. Or maybe the PBS is empty and you're better off going there. So that's the reason why this approach was doomed to fail. And I would argue that is why grids didn't, uh, the, in the traditional way, the way that they were introduced in, in uh, the late 90s, never caught on because they were all about work delegation and there was no resource allocation. So what we have been doing in Open Science Grid now is we created something that we call a gliding factory. And before we do this, we put another matchmaker next to the SCAD-D and we have the factory that's basically listening to the SCAD-D and saying, what's cooking there? How much work do you have? And based on the work that's accumulating there, it goes and uses the same mechanism I described to you earlier to basically submit jobs to these batch systems. But these jobs are not really the work. They are condo studies that are then connecting back to the matchmaker up there and forming a condo pool that then the SCAD-D can submit into it and run the condo application. So not only we solved the early work delegation without resource allocation that we had, but we also now do it in one uniform way. It doesn't matter if I run on my local condo pool, I run on the remote condo pool, or I run on the condo pool that was provisioned to me via the gliding factory, they all look the same. So what basically is happening is that the gliding factory is using its policies to use its own SCAD-D to provision resources for the local, the customer SCAD-D that represents the user. And obviously we can have many SCAD-Ds like this and you know, we can make this thing complicated. And almost all the resource, all the compute that's happening on Open Science Grid is happening through this mechanism today. This works. But now we can do more because in the same way that the SCAD-D can talk to a remote VAT system via a, con a, 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 a compute element interface, it can also talk to a remote cloud, whether it's EC2 uh, on demand or it's EC2 spot or any cloud provider there, it can come and say, I want to provision a resource on you. And therefore, we can do the same story as we had before, but in this case, we have, a, you know, I re refer here to EC2 to represent the traditional uh, on-demand access. It can be OpenStack or it can be EC2 spot. And then what I do is what I submit there are virtual machines. And this virtual machine has a start D, and the start D forms a condo pool, and the jobs are running on this condo pool, and it all looks the same. And I can basically mis mix and match what I showed you earlier with what I have here. So some of it will be here, some of it will be there, and I will show you how CMS and Atlas has been using this flexibility in their testing. So that's basically how these early ideas of high throughput computing and the flexibility and the resource allocation and the job delegation are all coming together in the way that we do things today and you can see how naturally the resources that are coming through cloud resources fit into this model. So our colleagues at CMS and, and Atlas, uh, with the generous help of uh, Amazon in terms of two grants that were provided to them, decided to explore how they can use these resources in their, in their computing environment. And uh, John Hoover at Brookhaven, Brookhaven National Lab 
in Long Island, did the work for Atlas, and then Bradley, who is at UW-Madison with us, uh, did the, the work for CMS that I will describe. So the first thing that they did, or one of the things that they did, is they said, okay, we need to benchmark how these resources work, or what do they deliver for our workload. I don't care what I'm being told in terms it's equivalent to something. And that's the way th these guys work. Everything that they uh, uh, pledge to the experiment and how they measure their uh, utilization in it, uh, is in, in these uh, HEP spec, which I don't know what it is, but I know that it's based on running the application to create the spec of the machine. And they started by running it on all these different instances. And here are the number that they got. And I don't think that the numbers are that important. But what I think is important here is the methodology that when you are trying to move your workload into this kind of an environment, then you have to understand what it really means, both in terms of cost, in time, and in how much would you need in order to meet the 200 million events that they have to process in the next week? And then they could take these numbers and go to the management and say, OK, if you want 10,000 uh, times 10 HS06, here's what it's going to cost. And this is why we think it will cost that much. So they can make a decision. Because within the experiment, they have to budget certain activities and decide whether they can do it. They, can, they have to order it. They have to schedule it. Because you have seen, A, the size of the experiments in terms of number of scientists, and B, the scope in terms of how much data and how much uh, computing they have to deal with. The next exercise was to see how do I integrate these resources into the CMS production environment. So I showed you all this hocus pocus on uh, PowerPoint, and we know how easy it is to demonstrate things with PowerPoint. But the question is, will it work, and will it carry the load, and what are all the corner cases that we have to cover? And they basically ran two experiments. One is they tried to get up to three cores for one month, because they were, trying, they were doing it on spot, so they cannot guarantee how much they have. And the other one, they were trying to get 100 cores for a week. And they integrated it into their local environment. So CMS had what's called the tier two at the University of Wisconsin, which is about three petabytes of spinning disk. And I think it's uh, somewhere in the 3,000, 4,000 cores today, which is one of the compute sites of the collaboration. And then they said, OK, we know how to extend it into open science grid through the mechanism that I showed you. We will now extend using the same mechanism into uh, EC2 spot resources. And their purchasing strategy was fairly simple. And that's what they went for or went after. And there's always the question of, of the memory sizes, there are some issues whether the memory size increments are in favor or not in favor of the way that they are doing their computing. And here are the results. And you will see, actually, the difference between what CMS uh, observed because of the workload and what Atlas did is because you know, CMS had almost a 50-50 ratio between compute and data transfer. And by the way, that's another interesting aspect here is while you can bid for the compute power, you cannot bid for the, for the transfer capacity. So here you have to pay what you have to pay. And, uh, and you can see here the, the number. So the important thing is that they reached the stability and they were able to actually demonstrate that it worked. And, that's, and, and these are the numbers. A similar stability uh, study was done by John Hoover at BNL with, with Atlas. And the Atlas environment is different because if you look at the picture on the left, they are use, they've been using sort of a two-tier 
scheduling system because they have their own uh, job dispatching, which is uh, Panda. CMS is using Raw Condo to do all their scheduling. So what they have there is they expanded the local condo pool. They're running, I think, a 12,000 core system at, uh, at BNL. They expanded it using the techniques that we talked about earlier into EC2 using Spot, created the virtual machines. These virtual machines became part of the condo pool. The condo pool launched what they called the pilot jobs, and the pilot jobs were patching the work from, from the Panda environment. So you can look at Panda as sort of a, a big master worker system. And basically the same, the same ideas, and uh, they start running it. You know, they had a 50K grant. And uh, they realized that they were able to go up to uh, 3,000 cores and then the thing start <laughs> limping. And they realized that they had to be more careful in the way that they structure it because of uh, the firewall issues, there are uh, wide area uh, GSI authentication issues and stuff like that, that you have to be careful with the allocation of resources for maintaining the infrastructure. And the condo collector, the matchmaker, got into uh, a 0.99 cycle duty of the, you know, it was failing to keep up with the event that it has to process. So after working with them, we reorganized, made sure that we provision the right amount of resources also on their side to manage. You know, the good, the good news is you can get a lot. The bad news is that you have still to manage it. So you have to make sure that your management infrastructure is appropriate. And they were able to run smoothly with 5,000 cores. And the way that Condo is structured, if they go to, to nodes that are multi-core, they, they believe they can easily go to 35,000 with the same structure and the same scalability. So uh, in terms of numbers, you can see that th their numbers were very different, where most of the uh, money went to, to computing and very little to, to movement of data because of the type of the workload that they had. And uh, in terms of stability and operation, they were pleased. Now it's obviously a management decision of if and when to use it. But it's also important for these experiments to be prepared and to provide their management the, the tools to say, OK, you're ready or you need it, we can do it. Two elements of, or you know, one, two elements of the same problem that we are still working on is the clean separation of star Ds from an, from an HD condo pool. So from the very beginning, for a node in the condo pool to disappear was something that we were prepared for, right? If it's running on your, on your workstation and you pull the plug or you spill coffee on your machine or whatever it is, the machine is gone and the, so is the start the end. We have to be prepared for it. But we always consider this as a, an error, an exception, something went bad and not normal operation. When we are operating in a spot environment, star is disappearing is way of life. And it can happen in two ways. One is that Amazon decides to take it away. And we want a clean separation. We don't want to sit there and wonder with time out what happened. It's nice if we say, we are gone. Amazon calls, calls us back to to, to the next world or whatever, or wherever it is, they take machines that they take away from poor users like us. And therefore, it's important for us to take advantage of the generosity of Amazon. It says, we'll give you the shutdown, but we will unplug you in two minutes, or something like that. So, so we sit there, we discover the, the, the gap, and we, are, we, we can now use the, this time to cleanly separate. 
before we, we disappear. Because otherwise, our, the, the integrity of our state is, is continuously in flux. A similar situation is when I, I want to accomplish something and I am trying to create the, the appropriate balance between on demand and spot. And as Jamie pointed out, there, there's a lot of room to interesting policy decision of when do I go for demand and when do I go to spot. But one thing we know, that if I want to demand and spot showed up, I would like to give Amazon back the on demand and use the spot. So again, I have to do a clean separation here. And if it's a single core, I want to bring it to a safe state. If it's a multiple core, I have also to bring it to a, a safe state, but I may have different jobs running there. So there is this whole process of bringing it to a safe state and then saying, Amazon, it's all yours. So this is what I have to, to tell you about everything from the God particle to high throughput computing. And I will pass back the, the virtual microphone to Jamie. Thanks, Fran. Okay, so I thought I'd use our last couple of minutes before we go into, into uh, Q&A to talk about a few other real-world applications of, of the high-throughput computing approach, uh, many of which use uh, HD Condor as well. So this is a picture of the, the Gaia satellite. This is a, a satellite that was launched by the European Space Agency. And back in 2009, this was actually the first space mission to use AWS. So uh, Gaia mission is, uh, is really interesting because its, uh, its goal is to observe over a billion stars over a seven year period and look for any, any wobble uh, that, that occurs with a star that's likely caused by, by an exoplanet. And as you can imagine, you know, as we have more and more observations over time, not only more stars, but more observations for each of those stars, this data set starts to get much larger um, as, as time progresses. And so a more traditional approach for, um, for, for managing a mission like this, or managing the compute and storage resources associated with these missions would be to have uh, a budget that says, okay, a year before the, the spacecraft actually launches, let's go out and buy a bunch of servers and let's buy all the storage that we, we think we might need for this mission. And then over time, um, in this case, you know, a seven year stretch, eight year stretch, um, you know, processors are gonna get a lot faster, storage is gonna get a lot less expensive and, and also get faster. And uh, the mission, because it, it's procured in advance, um, will, have, will, will be constrained to the available resources that they, that they purchased at the time. And so it's very common for any type of, of large uh, scientific project, not only uh, space missions like, like Gaia, uh, for you to, to go back over time, especially if you're monitoring uh, large data sets, to go back and, and reprocess your existing data as you come up with enhancements or refinements to the algorithms that you're using to you know, analyze or, or, or visualize that data. And so the Gaia mission developed a, a novel technique for, uh, for, for using AWS to in, in spot instances when those first came on the market. To, to very quickly reprocess the entire data set in, in just a matter of a, of a couple of days. Whereas previously, if they had constrained themselves to what they would have purchased otherwise, uh, it would have taken months to do that, and they would have had to kind of scatter that work um, on top of the kind of the background processing that they were doing for the data as it was, as it was streaming in. And so Spot was really an integral uh, part of, of this, this, first, this first mission to use the cloud for space applications. Apologies for the, the controller here. Um, so another project I wanted to talk about is, is, is using HT Condor, and this is a, a collaboration that we have with uh, Caltech, the uh, Infrared Astronomy Institute that's uh, funded by NASA, and University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute. So Caltech uh, brings uh, the astronomers to the, to the collaboration, and USC brings the, the computer scientists who built uh, Pegasus, which, which Marone uh, talked about a bit with the Atlas experiment. And uh, in this collaboration, we're building a, what will eventually be likely about a 200, uh, a 200 terabyte data set hosted as an AWS public data set at, at no cost to either of these institutions or to the general public. And what we're going to do is make available for the first time a multi-spectrum atlas of the entire Milky Way galactic plane with really, really fine resolution, uh, one, one arc second resolution. And the, the neat thing about this project is that it's going to be bringing in data from many spacecraft um, and many instruments on those spacecraft and normalizing it so that it'll appear as if it's coming from one single spacecraft. 
And so there's a lot of background data processing that has to occur. And in order to, to do that normalization, uh, we're relying on HT Condor and, and this, this concept of high-throughput computing to, to process this data inexpensively using EC2 spot instances. And so the net effect will be a public S3 bucket if you want to access the raw data, or if you like to use the Virtual Astronomy Observatory APIs, you'll be able to do that too, as well as having some EC2-hosted uh, web applications to, to you know, quickly uh, visualize the data and find the subset that you're interested in. And then the last example I wanted to talk about before we break for questions is one that's not yet running on Amazon, and, and it, there's, there's no indication that it will necessarily run on Amazon. I hope that it will. Um, for those of you who may not recognize this, this is the Kepler Space Telescope. And this is a telescope that was designed to find exoplanets, and it does so by looking at uh, the light curve, so uh, at how the, the intensity of the light dips when a, a planet outside of our solar system passes or, or transits in front of the star. And um, Kepler had a, a, a bit of misfortune over the past year. Um, on, on these types of satellites, they have something called reaction wheels. These, these wheels spin and help orient the spacecraft so they can stay focused on one star for a, a long enough period of time to, to, track, uh, to track the light as it's coming in. And two of these have failed now on Kepler, so it's not able to, to point as precisely as it needs to. But the good news is that there's so much data that's been collected by Kepler that given the, the compute resources that were made available to Kepler when it launched, um, it's, it's probably going to take about 10 years to analyze all that data. So we're already starting to find thousands of new exoplanets uh, just by you know, the initial uh, bit of data processing that we've already done with Kepler. And so the, the, the hypothetical question I'd like to ask here is what if, instead of taking that approach of using that, that pre-purchased infrastructure, what if we instead decide to use the approach that Marone described and instead allocate a massive cluster of machines using EC2 spot and instead process that data in about two months? What could NASA do with a 10-year head start, knowing all of the exoplanets are out there, knowing their profiles, and knowing the ones that are in the Goldilocks zone? We could design a whole new mission and possibly even launch that, given the funding, of course, and, uh, and really advance the state of exoplanet research. Um, so that's a, that's a fun little idea to, to mull over. Um, so